Good morning, everyone. In this session, we are going to continue our study of sexual activity in marriage, and in particular, a passage or a phrase that comes out of 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. And I've entitled this particular message, How the Christian Husband Should Treat His Wife. We began on this uh, the last few moments of last Sunday, and uh, so today we want to uh, continue in that vein. You will remember that the passage says, give honor to, uh, to her, and uh, that idea uh, has uh, two uh, pictures for us. The first picture is that of a shepherd leading his flock to green pasture, and the second one is a historical one. It's the history of two brothers who actually only one of them was king, but the other one was given the honor to be king. And uh, the rumor was spread that he really wanted to be the only king. And uh, that was then followed by a great deal of turmoil and death. <clears throat> this uh, participial phrase that says, give her honor, is a participial phrase which has the force of a command. Um, the participial phrase is giving her honor, but it's a, it's, it has the force of a command, which would be give her honor. And so this, uh, this passage or this verse uh, means that the Christian husband should give her honor, and let me uh, begin this way by saying that <clears throat> before we get into the should nots, what it is that the husband should not do, we want to give a little bit of background because there's no such thing as an argument, there's no such thing as a relationship between two people that is only one-sided. There are always two sides. And in this particular passage of scripture, we have seen how the ladies of the congregation have been addressed in the first six or so verses. And now the husbands are addressed. But in order for us, because there's been a week or more since we have looked at this, we want to see what precedes what a husband should not do. So... The should-nots need to be preceded by an examination of some of the ways in which wives despise being fellow heirs. Our passage says that the wife is a fellow heir, a joint heir. This is the same status that we have with Christ. And so we want to see how it is that the Bible tells us that a wife despises that position. Okay, let me back off and put this in different words. When a boy grows up and he is taught respect and he is taught to be gentle with the uh, opposite sex, we say that he's not just a man, but he's a gentleman. When girls are growing up, we say that they grow up not just to be women, but to be ladies. And so we want to show the difference between a lady and a woman. A lady is given that particular status in the scripture, but many times she represses that ladyship by reverting to just being a woman. And so let me give you two areas in which that shows. Would you please turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 10? the 10th chapter, or the 14th chapter of Proverbs. We'll get to chapter 10 in a while. Proverbs 14. And without dealing very much in the context, let's just um, go into verse 14. The wise woman... And we could say this is a woman who has taken in wisdom from above, builds her house. 
This is that relationship that she enjoys with her husband and with her children. She builds her house. But the foolish woman tears it down. And then notice that it says, with her own hands. In other words, this means that she's not just the victim. She is the author of tearing down a relationship, tearing down a home. And she is the one who does it. How does that take place? Well, the first way in which it takes place is through sabotage. Sabotage. And this is for both public and private conduct. And that is an undermining of the husband's plan. Let's say he's got some plan to do something. And she suggests an alternate plan. Now this and probably for this to make the best contrast, to say this happens in public. He has a plan to do such and such. She comes up with an altar plan. I think that this would be better. And she presses that plan. Or she redefines the goal of that plan. That is sabotage in that relationship. Or there are negative emotions that precipitate an environment or an atmosphere. The dourness, the negativity, the sadness, the anger. And you can feel the tension in the air. You may walk into the room and there's tension in the air. What is it? It's that negative emotion that has spread. And that is one of the ways in which sabotage takes place. A third way is an energized passivity. And that is uh, that the plan is put on the table and I don't care. Do whatever you want. Or I am not going to participate in that plan. These are ways in which that house is being torn down with her own hands. Now, Secondly, there are outright challenges to the husband's authority. Now, I'm saying this because, as I'm going to show you in the next point, that husbands, you're not supposed to lecture your wife. You're not supposed to correct her in public. You're not supposed to ridicule her. You're not supposed to dress her down to brace her or something in public. So this is that context. All right, number two, an outright challenge to the husband's authority. What this does, that is, when there's an outright challenge, is that it results in a diminishing of his integrity. Obviously, uh, if he were smart, he wouldn't have planned that. He wouldn't have decided that. But I'm smarter than he is, so that's uh, the way things are. An outright challenge results in a potential coup d'etat. And in a coup d'etat, you are saying, come on over to my side and abandon his. Well, the book of Proverbs has a few things to say. And uh, Proverbs 12 and verse 4, this first verse emphasizes the relationship that, sustain, that she sustains with her husband. Would you open your Bibles, please, to Proverbs chapter 12. Sorry, it's a typo. Proverbs 14, please. And let me... <clears throat> well, I think we just read that a few moments ago. Uh, let me go back here. Chapter 12. My pages are maybe sticking together. Verse 4, chapter 12, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband. This is one of those statements that probably galls a lot of women. To think that her husband would be crowned or that he would have the spotlight on him. But an excellent wife 
is the crown of her husband. But she who shames him is like rottenness to his bones. That puts in variance the sweet and gentle character that the Christian husband should have because he's supposed to be emulating Christ as Christ loves the church and gives himself for the church. And instead, there's rottenness in his bones. So what is it that is doing? Well, it's because husbands are not Christ. They should emulate him, but they're not. Next passage of scripture, would you turn to Proverbs 31? This is a passage which is a very uh, favorite of many people. It's uh, <clears throat> very popular uh, with many people, and it is a beautiful, beautiful uh, combination of verses that elicit for us the excellence of a wife. Verse 10 begins this way, An excellent wife who can find. Now the question mark there is a question mark which means that if you find an excellent wife, you have found a treasure far beyond your ability to count its value. An excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. And we want to make sure that we understand this. And let me, let me tell you why as we go by. There is an enumeration of these wonderful characteristics that make an excellent wife. But ladies, when you're not being an excellent wife, there's this rottenness in your husband's bones. And it's one of those things that you just can't get away from. Next verse, 11. The heart of her husband trusts in her. There's probably nothing as valuable in the mind of a man when he can trust his wife. He can trust her with his life, his bank account. He can trust her with his honor, with his reputation. That is something that you can't buy. And ladies, when you are able to get that trust from your husband, you have something which is far above jewels. Verse uh, 11, and he will have no lack of gain. And the idea here is that she's not going to throw a monkey wrench into his business dealings. Um, he will have no lack of gain. And basically, it's because God is going to bless him. Verse 12, she does him good and not evil. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. This is, you know, like those gourmet foods. She makes these gourmet foods that you can't get there in Israel. All you can get is that dry mutton. And who likes that? She considers a field, verse 16. Oh, let me, I, I skip verse 15. She rises while it is still early, and she gives food to her maidens. Verse 15 is a very important verse. It'll show up, the, the, its importance will show up a little later. She, rise up while, she rises up while it is still night. In other words, her day begins in the morning because she has a sense of responsibility. She knows that there are things that need to be done. And then it goes on to say, and she gives food to her uh, maidens or gives portions to her maidens and the idea is that she has a staff of maids or uh, girls that that help around the house and that she administrates them she's not uh, the wife is not a menial servant in the house she's an administrative person in the house and I would encourage uh, all of you men and ladies here to seek somebody to come into your house and to help with the cleaning or with things that need to be done so that your wife has some administration 
and that you give her that portion which God has given to her. After all, she is joint heir with you. So her sense of responsibility uh, goes to feeding her house and to giving portions, that is to assigning jobs and assigning rewards to those who work for her. 16, she considers a field and buys it. This means that she has authority over some finances in the house. She has the authority to make real estate purchases. And uh, you say, well, isn't that kind of costly? Yeah, but you see, her husband trusts her. See, if it was just a five and 10 cent dime store type of a purchase, then there wouldn't be any trust involved. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. This is the advancement of uh, an enterprise. Verse 17, she girds herself up with strength. In other words, she takes care of herself. There's self-care that's involved here. And makes her arms strong. And once again, this is self-care, but it goes a little bit beyond that because it refers to the intimacy in the bedroom. Next verse. She senses that her gain is good and her lamp does not go out at night. I think that's pretty explanatory. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. She's industrious. She works at home. In those days, they didn't have uh, uh, a clothing store, so she made the clothes for the family. And then verse 20, this is where you see her inner beauty begin to come out. She extends her hands to the poor. She stretches out her hands to the needy. She has a heart of compassion. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. In other words, she has made clothes for the family and she's made her clothes uh, uh, for them out of the best materials. 22, she makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. And then verse 23, her husband is known in the gates. And I want to bring this verse to your attention. Her husband is known in the gates. Up until now, the old boy hasn't been mentioned. But Big and Ugly comes up at this point. How come? He comes up at this point because his prominence is partially the result of her behavior at home. And if she is going to remain just a woman, her husband will have no prominence. But if she becomes a lady, he will become prominent. And everybody will recognize that he is prominent because of her. And this is what goes all the way back to verse 15, that she gets up early in the morning while it is still night because she's diligent. See? And when you as husbands recognize the diligence of your wife, you are able to see how closely together you have been placed by God. Remember, God made a helper suitable for him, not a contender, but a companion. Not somebody who's going to compete with him, but a companion. And this is what we see in these verses. Verse 23, once again, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. This verse has only those two clauses. And the clause is the that he is known in the gates. He has notoriety. He has prominence. And then it goes on to say, when he sits among the elders of the land. In other words, he doesn't just have prominence. He's in the place of governance. And those are two 
places where the husband has been elevated, has been promoted by this excellent wife. Verse 24. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies belts to the tradesmen. Strength and dignity are her clothing. In verse 25, we see that what makes her elegant, what makes her valuable, is her strength and her dignity. When does a woman lose her dignity? Well, I'll give you an example. You're at Walmart or you're one of these stores and your baby's crying to high heaven. I want that piece of candy. You can't control your kids. Or uh, maybe you're at a public meeting and as a lady, you bark out a big snorting laugh like you would if you were at a Mariners game. No dignity. You have to know what your parameters are. There's a place for everything and a time for everything. And she smiles at the future. One of the hardest things for you ladies to do. This means that the future doesn't scare you you smile at it. Why? Because you are dependent on the almighty hand of God. I'll tell you, this is powerful. She opens her mouth in wisdom. Well, we can just leave that the way that it is. And the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. And we can just leave that the way it is because it just is so eloquent the way that it is. She looks well on the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her, husband, her children rise up and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her saying, quote, Many daughters have done nobly. Now let me just camp out on this for a little bit. Ladies, what this means is that the man, when he married you, did not get a lobotomy. He can look at another woman and he can say, you know, she's got a nice bod. But at the same time, he can say, there are a lot of beautiful women, but my wife exceeds them all. Now, if your husband can't tell the difference between you and somebody else, you married somebody with, that's brain dead. And so he says, quote, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Tell you what, that's worth gold. If he says, well, you're a pretty good second place, you know you're in trouble. Verse 30, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but the woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Then we come to verse 31. Give her the product of her hands. Remember the hands that turned on the household? Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Where's that? That's where her husband is. See, you've got to put these two verses together. So, that's a word to the ladies. Let's go on to the men. Ah, before we go on to the men, let me read to you uh, something that was commented uh, by Albert Barnes, uh, a commentator from a year gone, gone by. The excellent wife. She is a loving wife and feels for the respectability and honor of her husband. He is an elder among his people, and he sits as a magistrate at the gate. He is respected not only on account of the neatness and cleanliness of his person and dress, but because he is the husband of a wife who is justly held in universal esteem. And that means that 
You may not recognize it as a lady, but the world looks at you and holds you up when they see your husband. And her complete management of household affairs gives him full leisure to devote himself to civil interest of the community. Albert Barnes. Okay, this verse, 1 Peter 3, 7, this verse means that Christian husbands should, number one, not insult, lecture, or boss her in public. So she may say something. This does not give you license to brace her in public. Does not give you license to lecture her or to boss her around in public. Number two, husbands, Christian husbands should not talk behind their backs so as to be critical or to tell crude jokes about her. And uh, there, those jokes are in abundance. They're all over the place. Number three, number three prime, do not compare her to your previous partner. Perhaps you've been married before. Do not compare her to your previous partner, especially to your parents. Well, my first wife, she was way better. Or some other point of comparison. Not only is it in poor taste, but what you are saying is that when God joined you to wife number two, the second wife, that he didn't do as good of a job as he could have. Number four, do not compare her to your imaginary partner or partners. If you were only like, and then you can fill in the blank. Don't do that because you are destroying the relationship that you have And number five prime, do not express contempt for your wife. There is an anatomy to all arguments. And in that anatomy, there are stages as the argument progresses. When you get to the place where you express contempt for your wife, you have gone into the toxic zone. And it won't be long before that toxicity will poison your relationship and it will take an act of God for you to put your marriage back together. One of the things that happens in divorce is that one of the parties, one of the two married parties decides, I've had it with this relationship, I'm just going to wait till the right time. Maybe I'm going to wait till the children are the right age, or maybe I'm going to wait till a certain trigger. Doesn't matter. The point is that one party says, well, you know, maybe we can still pull this marriage out of the fire. The other person has already decided there's no way, Jose. And this may be the year 2019, but he decided way back in 2014, five years ago, that the marriage was over. And so it doesn't matter what you do, he's already pulled the trigger. And it's only a matter of time before it snaps. How do you know that that's going to happen? When you express contempt for your partner. I hate you. That's contempt. Okay. Give her honor. This is what you should do. Number one, share your family name with her. Share your family name with her. Show her that she is now part of your family. If she's a woman and not a lady, she won't enjoy that. We see that today in our culture. Uh, there are women who will not assume the name of their husband. Share your real estate with her. Of course, in the state of Washington, it's automatic. Once you're married, 
Everything you have is now cut in half. She's entitled exactly to 50% of it. Your real estate, your car, your bank account, your vacation. Don't take vacations by yourself. Obviously, there are times where you might want to. Uh, maybe you and, and your friends are going to take a motorcycle trip or something like that. Um, but by and large, take your vacations together because you belong together. And make your daily plans with her so that you are planning your days together. If you're married at 20, you have approximately 60 years of life together before you finally kick the bucket. Make every one of those days count. Don't waste the years, the weeks, the decades. Make them count. So this is for husbands, but remember, husbands aren't the only ones who can destroy a relationship. So can you ladies. Number eight, share your honors, your rewards, and your praise with her. Maybe you were honored with having longevity at your job. Maybe you were awarded for a job done with excellence. Share your praise with her because she is the one who has stood behind you and has supported you and so many other things. <coughs> and maybe it's not just the physical logistics that has been a support to you. Maybe it's been the emotional uh, support where she encourages you to continue with the job. And oftentimes you see this happen uh, with women who are way superior than we men. And uh, maybe he is writing a book and she says, you know, don't give up. Keep it up. Keep it up. Share your honors, your rewards, your praise with her. Table etiquette. When you sit down to eat, pull out her chair. It's, she is being honored by you. We're not hogs that we all race to the trough and put our muzzles down into the slop. We're gentlemen and ladies. Ladies, wait until your husband pulls the chair out for you. And when he pulls it out and puts you in under the table, I don't mean drink you under the table, I mean, you know, pushes the chair under the table, then thank him. We're not pigs, we're people. If you're invited to somebody's home, you'll notice that the husband, if he is a gentleman, won't start to eat until his wife starts to eat. Don't you start to eat before the husband does either. It's not just good manners. It's giving honor to a home. And it's giving honor to a husband and a wife who are trying desperately to live this Christian life. One of the uh, points that I like to observe is that at no time when there's a dinner party, should your wife sit on the floor and you sit at the table. She's not a dog that's going to get the scraps off of the table. She's your wife. And if you're the wife, don't insist on sitting on the floor. He's giving you honor. Don't tear down that relationship. Build it up. In sharing your honor or your rewards, you can have a situation like this. The missus and I, you, know, you can say, you know, whatever her name is, the missus and I want to announce the engagement of our son or the engagement of our daughter 
or we want to announce a pregnancy, or we want to announce a baptism, or we want to announce a birthday, include her in it because she is part of you and you are joint heirs together. Okay, I see that my time is up. Next time we'll have to go to point number four, and that is that she is a fellow heir of the grace of God. All right, let's take our break.